speak through brother Chris Lord that we would receive what it is you have for us this day and Lord we would put into practice your word Lord we love you and we praise you and it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things amen amen y'all grab a seat well good morning it is awesome to be with you guys I want to welcome you back uh, to Round Prairie if you're one of our online uh, listeners and watchers uh, thank you so much for choosing to get online and worship with us today and it is always good to see everyone um, here in person as well. If you're a guest here, uh, we definitely want to say thank you so much uh, for choosing to worship with us. We do typically um, act more friendly. You know, we shake hands and give hugs. Uh, but right now, that's not friendly, evidently. People look at you like you got the plague. And so, anyway, so hey, we're going to air hug you right here. Okay, ready? Do you feel it? Yeah, that was weird, right? Okay, so anyway, it is so good to be here uh, with y'all. We're going to jump right in this morning. You know, over the last several weeks, uh, we've been going through a sermon series called Ordinary here at Round Prairie. And, and um, if you've been here, you kind of know what I'm going to say, but if you haven't, I want to kind of uh, catch you up. What we've been talking about um, over the last several weeks is this idea that we see um, all throughout Scripture and all throughout history uh, that God seems to delight in taking ordinary people, ordinary circumstances, ordinary days, and just intervening and doing something extraordinary um, in, the, in our midst. And uh, we've kind of been looking throughout the Bible so far at several different characters and different um, circumstances where God showed up and did some extraordinary things and some really ordinary uh, type of people. And we say, you know, that gives us great hope because when I look in the mirror, I don't see a superstar. Amen. I mean, I don't look in the mirror and go, man, that guy's got it all together. I look in the mirror and go, whoo, I hope he makes it through today, right? I mean, you ever look in the mirror in the morning and go, wow, I just hope today um, is not the day that I just fall apart. And um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to know that, hey, at the end of the day, uh, that even when I am at um, my most broken, I have a God um, who, can, who can heal anything and do extraordinary things in my life. And I want to tell you right now that um, no matter who you are and where you find yourself, I hope today's story uh, that we study uh, will show you something that God can take anyone, and I mean anyone, and He can do something extraordinary in their life. 
Uh, we've talked about faith. We've talked about trust. We've talked about heart. Because here's what we know is that while God is the one who does the extraordinary things, he uses humans to do those things. He uses uh, the characters and the, and, and the traits and the, the natural um, tendencies of people. He uses some of these things that people that he has created and put in us um, to accomplish some of these things. We talked about faith. We talked about trust. We talked about da- David's heart last week. Well, today we're going to specifically talk about a word. We've kind of found a key word in every, every sermon, and today's going to be the word decisions. Um, and when I say the word decisions, some of y'all uh, are great at making decisions, and you don't mind making decisions, and for you, you're like, good, this is something I can get into. For some of y'all in this room, you're terrible at decisions, right? I mean, if I were to ask right now, and I, I do find it kind of true in marriages that usually there's a one person that's really good at it and one person that's just not really good at making decisions. I don't mean that mean. I just mean you don't like it. It's, it's out of your comfort zone. How many of y'all just are natural born decision makers? Man, if there's a decision to be made, you want to make it. Anybody? Y'all like it? Y'all like it? Yeah, right? Right? Look, you know what you did? You said, I'm going to decide. I'm going to stick my hand right up, right? I'm not worried about these people, what they think about me, right? How many of y'all, you really don't like making decisions? Not not. Yeah, look at y'all. I mean, I was just impressed you got your hands up, okay? I really am. Like, I'm, I'm really impressed. Some people just, just do not like making decisions. I always laugh, and I say, you know, there's natural-born decision-makers, and then there's like three spreadsheet, panel of experts consulting, five prayer me- uh, meeting decision-making people. You know what I'm talking about, right? I can't just make a decision. I have to exhaust every possible idea before I just pull the trigger on a decision. Y'all know people like that? Yeah, and that's just where you're going to eat lunch today, right? I mean, like, you're just trying to figure out where you're going to eat lunch. I tell you, when I got married, I didn't know that one of the most difficult, controversial, contentious times in my marriage would be when one of us said, where do you want to eat tonight? Who would have known? I thought things like, hey, you know, um, what's the meaning of the universe might be contentious. You know, I thought things like, hey, you know, what is your belief on the Trinity? You know, I mean, what's your belief, you know, on, on, on post-millennialism? I mean, what's your belief on the... I thought those would be the hard things that I would deal with in my life. But I want to tell you, the hardest decision in, that in our marriage has been, where are we going to eat lunch? Anybody else? Y'all with me, right? Where are you going to eat lunch? Because here's what happens inevitably, okay? And I told my wife this, so y'all don't, don't think I'm a bad person. I, I asked her, can I share this? She said, yeah, okay? <laughs> Where do you want to eat lunch? What is the first thing? I don't know about you, but I, I'm going to say wives. Okay, so you husbands, I want you to listen. Answer me this. When you say, where do you want to eat, what does she say? I don't care. But she does. She does. Where do you want to eat lunch? I don't care. So, so this, this kind of went on. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not picky. I can eat anything. That is not true, okay? So, so here's the thing. So when, when we were first married, we lived up in Tyler, and we lived in a little apartment. And that's back, you know, when you, when, you, when, when you had a little bit of money because the kids hadn't sucked it all out of you yet, and you had a little bit of money, you had a little bit of freedom, you could just not go out and eat because, you know, who wants hamburger helper every single day, right? And, and so you're, you're first married, you got a chance, you're going to go out to eat, and we be like, hey, where do you want to go? I don't care. And that went on for day after day after day. And finally, I'm going to be honest, y'all, I just got really tired of it, okay? I did. Just, just frankly, I was like, I know it matters. I'm tired of making the decision every time. And so I came up with an idea. And here was my idea. Every time she says it, I'm going to take her to McDonald's. Every single time. Where do you want to eat? I don't care. Number seven for you. <laughs> Where do you want to eat? I don't care. Chicken nuggets. Where do you want to eat? I don't care. McDouble. I'm telling you, what I learned through my little experiment was one thing, that's way too much McDonald's. And number two, she did care. Because pretty soon, hey, where do you want to eat? 
not McDonald's. Okay, now it's no longer like I know what I want, but I know what I don't want. And so, so what I'm getting at is, is, is we do care, but sometimes we don't like to make decisions. And really, the higher the stakes, really, is, is the harder the decision to be made. Well, well, one of the things you look at when you look at this series we're calling Ordinary is that everybody that we've talked about had to make a decision at some point, either to step forward or step back, to go left instead of go right, or to go right instead of go left. Everybody had to make a decision. But one of the things you're going to see is that, that, that even though they all made decisions, they didn't know they were going to be extraordinary decisions at the moment. They were just making a decision for the day in front of them. But their decision was made because they had made some bigger decisions in their life a long time before. In other words, let me tell you, before David ever went out to meet Goliath, David decided as a young man that God was going to be his God. And so when Goliath came, the decision to go out and face Goliath was not David's greatest decision. That was a byproduct of a decision he had made a long time ago that there's one God under heaven by, man, by who um, he's going to serve. And that's all that really mattered to David when he faced Goliath. When Daniel went to the, lion, to the lion's den way back in the Old Testament, Daniel's biggest decision was not to go open his windows and pray. That was a given because he had made a decision a long time ago that God was worthy to be praised praised. And so because he made a bigger decision, a deeper decision a long time ago, when the ordinary decisions came his way, they just naturally flowed out of something deeper that was already decided way before that. And so when we start talking about ordinary becoming extraordinary, we need to talk about how do we make the decisions in our lives that put us in a position so that we make right decisions so that God can take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. You follow me? But there's some questions that we got to really understand. There's some deeper questions that we need to answer today so that when our extraordinary opportunity comes up, we will make an ordinary decision that leads to extraordinary results. And you don't see that probably anywhere illustrated greater than the life of a prostitute named Rahab. You know, one of the things about Rahab that I love about her story is that Rahab is not even what we would consider ordinary. We would call her less than ordinary. When you look at the life of somebody like Rahab, and you think about God using a life, I mean, it's one thing for God to use kind of decent people who just aren't real talented, but when God starts using people that we would consider less than, that completely blows my view of God up. Because God doesn't just use ordinary people. God uses even what we would consider less than ideal, less than ordinary people to do some extraordinary things. You see, we're going to catch up to Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 today. And before you get there, you need to know a little bit about her. She was a prostitute. She lived in a place called Jericho. Uh, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, God had promised the Israelites when they left Egypt that he was going to take them to a promised land. It was a promise that he was going to fulfill because he made a promise to Abraham way back. And before um, all of this happens, God has made these promises to this nation, and now it's about time for Israel to go into the promised land and take possession of it. The first city they're going to encounter across the Jordan River in the new land is a city called Jericho. And so Joshua, the leader of Israel, sends out his spies, and he wants to go check out what's going on in the land. He sends out two guys, and they go into Jericho to kind of do a little reconnaissance work. And so they're going out throughout Jericho, they're checking it out, they're scoping it out, and they end up getting pursued by the kind of the officials of the city, and they hide out in a prostitute's house named Rahab. And they get to her house, and she hides them, and she protects them. And it's this one decision that changes Rahab's destiny. It's this one decision that Hebrews chapter 11 talks about her faith because of. It's by her faith that she hid the spies, and she was not destroyed with the rest of the people. It's this one decision that seems to be the pivotal moment for Rahab. It takes her from a life of prostitution in a polytheistic pagan culture in Canaan, and she becomes a citizen of the nation of Israel. It takes her from being a prostitute, a nobody from a, from a place she wouldn't want to be, to someone who's going to ultimately be in the line of Christ. She's going to be a great grandmother of King David. I mean, this woman's life turned completely around. And it all seemed to hinge on this one decision to hide these guys. 
But if you look deeper at the story, you're going to see that some other decisions were made first. And they all had to do with her belief. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn me to Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. And we're going to read down through verse 13 today. And what I hope you'll see is there are some three major decisions that Rahab makes here that lead the way for her to make the most important decision she ever would make. And in verse 8 of Joshua chapter 2, it says this. She's, she's hiding the spies, and it says, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea uh, for you when, he came up, when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in, and melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you, but the, because the, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. So we're going to stop right there. Rahab says, I need you to make a deal with me. I hid you, but I know that there is a reckoning coming soon. And I know that this land is going to be wiped out. I want to make a pact with you. Since I hid you, would you spare my life? Would you spare the life of my family? Would you set us apart? And so ultimately these guys make a promise. They say, yeah, we're going to do that. And ultimately they make a covenant with Rahab. And when the city is taken down, uh, Rahab ends up being spared. Her family is taken out and they are carried off with the nation of Israel. And she ultimately becomes a grandmother of King David, who ultimately becomes right in secession. If you follow it down, we see Jesus Christ himself was born from the line of a prostitute. But what is it that led Rahab to take such a risk? What in the world would, would lead somebody to take such a risk that they would hide foreign forces what in the world would have her take such a risk that she would hide these men when her own city officials are looking for them i mean what in the world was she thinking well i want to tell you there's three things that we see in rahab's life right here that we're going to talk about that if we get nailed down in our own lives we will set ourselves up for god to do some extraordinary things number one the decision rahab made first and foremost you see it in the first part of the passage is she decided what she was going to believe about god did you know if you are going to, to make good decisions in your life, if you're going to make decisions in your finances, if you're going to make decisions in your relationships, if you're going to make decisions uh, that go far beyond just church on Sundays, if you're going to make good decisions in your business, if you're going to make good decisions as a husband, good decisions as a wife, there's something that you may not understand, but you need to know these decisions need to first be rooted in a proper understanding of who God is. Because it's ultimately going to lead us to understand who we are in light of who God is, okay? But first thing, decision number one, you've got to decide what you're going to believe about God. I already told you, Rahab is from Canaan. This is a very polytheistic culture. What That's a big word to say there were many quote, gods that people worship from Canaan. I mean, Rahab knew a lot of different gods, little g gods, that she could have depended upon and sacrificed to and hoped it for in the midst of a very difficult situation. But Rahab said something just astounding here in the first part of this passage, especially if you start there um, at the, in verse 9. It says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites. Now, I want you to stop right there. If you study your Bible, this should blow you up, right? You should just really be amazed. If you remember the Red Sea, it's about 40 years before this. This is not like something that just happened last week. This is something that the news about this God of the people of Israel has been circulating among the nations on the, on the west side of the Jordan for quite some time. And what I find amazing about this. I want you to think about this for a minute. I'll look at the people of Israel, the people that should have known that God was in charge, should have known how great God was, should have known how God was powerful. They're sitting there penalized for 40 years on the other side of the Jordan because they didn't believe that God could do it. 
They didn't believe God could carry them through the promised land. They shrunk back in fear because they believed that the giants on the other side of the river were too great to be overtaken. But the people on the other side of the river had more faith in the God of the Israelites than the Israelites did. And Rahab's looking going, I believe something's true about that God. I believe he is the God of the Red Sea. I believe he is the God who empowered you to defeat those armies. I believe he is the God who's going to give you victory on this side of the Jordan, just like he did on the other side of the Jordan. You see, Rahab decided what she was going to believe about God, and she got her belief about God completely changed her belief about her current set of circumstances. You know, if you watch the news today, or if you uh, listen to any kind of a, you know, radio or anything, you're going to hear a lot of people who have a lot of opinions about who God is in the world today. I don't know about y'all, but um, I, I really get tired of hearing everybody's opinion about God. I mean, I mean, do you ever, I mean, I just hear people all the time. I literally read, I think it was last night or this morning, my, my morning and nights are running together. Y'all ever have that? But, but I read either early this morning or late last night or somewhere in between, I was reading um, this article and I linked into a video um, at a city council meeting um, up in the Metroplex somewhere where um, a, 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 a vice mayor, I didn't know that was a thing, but a vice mayor evidently opens the council meeting with a prayer um, as an atheist. And he begins to pray you know, to all these different gods, and he's, he's making a mockery of this idea of the God of the Bible. And I want to tell you, when I heard, I listened to this whole prayer take place, this prayer, and one thing that became abundantly clear, the God that he is rejecting is not the God of the Bible. It's a God of his own making. It's a God that he has heard about, but he knows really nothing about. And I want to tell you, if you um, have an improper view of who God is, then it's going to completely set you up to make poor decisions in your life and some terrible decisions because you're not going to be anchored in the reality of the situation. You see, Rahab knew who God was. She knew it better than the people of Israel seemed to know it at this point. And she began to adjust her life accordingly because she believed in the power of the God on the other side of the Jordan. So, so it, beg, it, it, gives me to, it makes me have a question, I guess. Where do we get our view about God from? I mean, Rahab could have believed anything about God. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people walking around Jericho telling all sorts of things about the God on the other side of the, of the Jordan. But why did Rahab end up with a right view of God? And, and how do we end up with a right view of God? You know, I think a lot of us, if we're, not, if we're not careful, we end up with our view of God being shaped by culture. We get our view of God shaped by the latest book. We get our, our view of God shaped maybe by a church. And we don't let our view of God be shaped by God's word on himself. You know, one of the things that I'll tell you, I think one of the most dangerous things in all of Christianity right now, and I want you all to really hear me, is biblical illiteracy. It's, it's, a, it's not having a clue what the Bible actually says about the character and the nature and the plans that God has. And if you talk to people very long, you're going to find that a lot of people that are really hostile toward religion and hostile toward Christianity and hostile toward faith, they're hostile about a lot of things that shouldn't be, but they really don't have a proper view of who God actually is. And let me tell you, if your God is just a buddy, he's just your homeboy, he's just a guy who's just no better than anybody else, maybe just a little bit, and he's just a little bit higher than you, you got the wrong God. You see, Rahab, she didn't look at God like that. He was the God who splits the, the Red Sea. He's the God who defeats armies. He's a God who does things that these little gods over here never could do. And because of that, it led to a right decision that changed her life. So many of us, we have the wrong view of God if we're just really honest with ourselves. And if you really ask yourself, where did your view of God come from? I think a lot of us have a view of God handed down maybe from our family, maybe from our friends, maybe from our circumstances. And we begin to believe some really improper things about who God is and what God is about because we've never really gone to the source and seen him for ourselves. 
you want to make good decisions in your life, you've got to decide what you're really going to believe about God because that will lead inevitably to what you're going to believe about yourself. And that's the next thing that we see in Rahab. She decides what she's going to believe about herself by who she sees God to be. Look at verse 11. It says this, and it says it really in verse 10, but in verse 11 it kind of highlights it again. She says, When we heard it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage fell because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. I want you all to really hear this for a minute. Uh, if, if you don't have the right view of God, it's going to lead to a wrong view of yourself. But when you start getting the right view of who God is and just how powerful God is, it will begin to lead you to a right view of just how not great you are. Now, I want to tell you, I tell you all this all the time. I know I do, and I don't want to be so pessimistic, but if you woke up this morning just feeling like you're just a rock star and God's got some great deal with you, you have got a wrong view of who you are. The only good in me comes because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's it. That, that's it. I'm special to my mama, and I'm special to God, but I'm not special to God because I've got something God needs. I'm special to God because God has a special love that he wants to give to me. You see, that's how this thing works. Rahab seems to understand something that a lot of times we, we get lost in. It is she understood that if this is the God who I think he is, then I am melting in fear. Our hearts have melted in fear. Everyone's courage is failing because we understand the condition that we're in if this God is who we think he truly is. Did you know that your, your, your view of yourself has a direct effect on the quality of choices you make in your life? When I was a kid, I used to really be into Superman, okay? I really did. And, and I remember um, when I was really little, about, you know, 13 or 14. No, I'm joking. When I was about um, six, five or six years old, I remember um, going around the house, and I would ask my mom to make me a cape. And, and most of y'all did this, right? I mean, some of y'all had actual capes, but, you know, I guess we were poor. Um, so we used, like, dish towels and pillowcases, okay? And I would say, Mom, can make me a cape? And she'd make me a cape, and, and she'd pin it on my shirt, and, and I remember I'd run around, and from that moment, man, I was Superman. Y'all ever do that? I mean, some of y'all still do it, right? I mean, <laughs> let's just be honest. And I remember, though, I would, I would, I would run, and I would jump, and, and I would fly. You know, I'd jump off the couch. I would jump off the steps at the front porch. I mean, I would do all this crazy. I mean, I just remember being a kid and just loving it, right? But one thing I always thought, I, was, I wonder if I climbed up on the roof if I could make it, like if I could really fly. Like, I really did. I thought, man, I bet you I could really fly, you know? But one of the things I, I look back and realize is I never did it. You know why? Because even at five, six years old, I knew enough about me to know that I wasn't actually Superman. And because of that, it protected me from making some really dumb decisions with my cape. Because at the end of the day, you can jump off the roof all day. You can even have a big S on the back of your cape. But if you ain't him, you're going to hit the ground. Well, why do I tell you that? Here's why I'm telling you this. Because I think, spiritually speaking, if we don't understand who we actually are, we begin to make some really poor choices in our lives regarding our faith and our spirituality. You see, the Bible teaches a lot about who we are with God and who we are without God. Matter of fact, Romans 5.10 probably sums it up better than almost any other passage in all of Scripture. And it says this, Paul's uh, talking, he says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Paul says, guess what? Before you and I come to know Christ, there is a word that God uses to describe us. What's the word? Enemies. I don't know about y'all, but... But if, if I don't know Christ, that should scare me to death. And I'm not here to make you, make you feel terrible about yourself. I want to make sure you have all the facts today. If you do not have Christ, understand this. While God loves you and while God wants to save you, you have put yourself as an enemy to God because of your sin. And every one of us in this room have been enemies at one point or another in our lives. Every single one of us. We all have that in common. So don't sit here and go, well, that church is just telling me this. They want me to be. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying everyone in this room shares this common thread. We're all enemies of the cross. 
because of sin. And, and, and Paul says, look, we were enemies. That's how, God, that's how we're described. That's, that's just who we are. We're, we're opposing the God of the universe. I mean, this, this is not like, well, I, I can be kind of jovial with God, and then I, I can kind of do a little bit of church, and I can kind of do a little bit of the world. He goes, no, if you're not in Christ, you're an enemy of Christ. But when you are in Christ, guess what happens? He says, he reconciles, he makes us right with him through Christ. He says, if we're reconciled, how much more should we be saved through his life? What, what Paul says, look, just like we were enemies, and that has an extreme fear to it, because of Christ, when you know Christ is your Savior, I mean, you've been reconciled and made right. And so now you don't have to live with shame and guilt and fear and all of the other things that you used to live with. I think there's just as many people in this room today that needs to hear the second part of that verse as it needs to hear the first. If you're not in Christ, you're an enemy of the cross. And because of that, you are in a very dangerous place with the God of the universe. The wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. So, so, so here's what I want to get at. I think some of us in this room need to hear this message. That because you have Christ, it doesn't mean you don't mourn over sins. It doesn't mean you don't repent when you mess up. But I think a lot of us live with a constant state of guilt and shame. Because we're just not perfect. But this passage says, guess what? With Christ, you have been made right with God already. So, so maybe in your practice, you're messing up. Maybe in your practice, you could do better. Maybe in your practice, you could read your Bible more, go to church more, drink less, part, whatever. And that's all true, okay? It doesn't mean we don't need to work on those things. But positionally, who you are in Christ, because Christ went to the cross, you and I have been made right with God. So when God sees us, He doesn't see us as... You know, people who are just objects of his wrath, he sees us now as sons and daughters of his that he loves and he cares about deeply. And I think that's one of the reasons God gives us this illustration of sons and daughters is because when I look at my children, even though they messed up, it never changes the fact that they're still my child. There's some of you in the room, I think a lot of times Satan's greatest weapon is to get us to feeling so less than that we begin to get nothing done for the kingdom of God. I mean, are y'all with me? How many of us sit on the sidelines of faith because the reality is that we know that, man, I just, I know what I did yesterday. I know what I did last week. I, I know how I blew it with my kids. I, knew how, I know how I talked to my wife. And we never get off the sidelines of faith because we live with shame and we live with fear and we live with guilt and we forget that we are reconciled and made right with the God of the universe because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I think somebody needs to hear that. I do. I've read an article just sometime. can't remember. It's all blended together. And it talked about this state that so many Christians live in, this constant just nagging guilt. And while guilt's okay if it drives us to do good things, guilt's not okay if it makes us forget the beauty of the cross. It's not okay if it makes us forget the beauty of salvation. It's not okay if it makes us forget the glory of Christ. It's not okay. It's okay to feel guilt over things. It's okay. We should feel those things. But it's not okay when it draws our attention away from the glory and the goodness of God and puts it all on our own inadequacies. I mean, we should rest in the beautiful fact that if we are God's children, we are already made right in Him. Decide what you're going to believe about God, but decide what you're going to believe about yourself. Rahab had to decide, if God is this God, then, then where does that leave me? It left her in a terrible spot, and it left the whole place in a terrible spot. And because of that, Rahab decided she needed to do something, and that's really the third and final decision she made that, that really led to, to her whole life being changed, but she decided what she was going to do about it. She hears the glory of this God. She hears the power of this God. She sees her current situation, but she actually gets to work and acts on it. You know, the spies came by. She could have done anything, but she decided to act on what she had learned, what she truly believed. And, and this is one thing I want to leave you with today. You can hear, you can be inspired, you can be convicted all day long, but if it never translates into a changed life, it does you no good. 
Matter of fact, I would say it probably is, is worse off because now you cannot plead ignorance. You know, you've heard, you've been inspired, you've been convicted, you've been challenged, and yet you still don't. I think it's more blessed to be ignorant than it is to be informed and not take action. I want you to, want you to hear this. See, Rahab could have done anything with the information, but now she actually acts on it and she hides the spies. She hides them. And she sends the officials off the other way. She lets them out of her house. And ultimately, that decision changes her whole life. But it happened because she acted on what she believed to be true. You know, I'm 40 years old now. And um, a few months ago, I had one of those checkups that you get at the doctor's office. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those where you go up there and they tell you how terrible you are, you, you know? And, and so I go up there and um, they do my lab work and... And I go in to be seen, and, and, and they look at me and, and, and kind of go through my labs with me. And, and pretty soon, you know, I'm kind of challenged because I'm like, okay, I'm 40 years old. That's not as young as it used to be, right? Some of y'all are like, that's pretty young, Brother Chris. Well, I, I'm talking to 20-year-olds right now, not, okay? It's old to y'all, right? Some of you 70 years old are like, well, he's a baby. I'm like, I, I can't believe he even gets to work, you know? So 40 years old, I begin to think about all the medical problems I could have in my life, and, and I begin to get all this blood work done, and here's my old cholesterol come down the pack. You know what I'm talking about. I get it, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah, that's a high number, right? Like, is this the higher we go, the, the better? Like, is it, is it like a carnival game? Like, if I, if I get to 200, like, the ding, 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 and I get something, they're like, yeah, you get a heart attack, you know? So, so, um, so they do my lab work, they, they check it out, and I look at my cholesterol. And I'm going to be honest, y'all, I think, okay, I'm 40 now, I'm looking at my lab work, and I'm thinking, eee, that's not great. And I was challenged. And, and, and in, inside, I was like, Somet- I need to change something, I've got to do something. Some of you are like, Brother Chris, you've lost so much weight. It's miserable. <laughs> it's not fun. I mean, it's not like I'm like, man, I'm... I'm so happy I don't get to eat Big Macs every day. You know what I mean? Like, Julie, you want to go to McDonald's later? But anyway, um, <laughs> but I'm getting at this. So many times when you go to your doctor, uh, you hear the labs, you, you hear the information, they tell you, hey, I mean, Dr. White's done this a million times to some of y'all, right? I mean, he didn't tell me. I just know he has, okay? And he tells you, hey, your cholesterol's high, your blood pressure's high, you know, your blood sugar's out of control. We're going to have to do something, you know? And you, you kind of get that feeling like, man, something's not right. I've got to make a change in my life. Y'all ever have that at the doctor's office? You know, ooh, this ain't good, right? Now, imagine every time you had that feeling, you took the labs, you took the information, you took everything you had, and you just threw it in the garbage on the way out and said, I'll pick that up next time I come to the doctor's office. Now, some of y'all do that, okay? I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I work in healthcare. Some of y'all do that. It's kind of like flossing. It's like I told y'all, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a discipline. I, I went to the dentist. I'm sorry. Hey, when's the last time you flossed? I'm like, when was the last time I was here? You know, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, that's gross. But um, anyway... But we, we toss it, and we, we're going to think about it, and it, and it changes how we think about ourselves, but it never, if it never makes it to the dinner table or it never makes it to our, to our, to our exercise, it just doesn't do really any good. We're just, we're just in, informed, unhealthy people. Now, now, what I'm getting at is this. How many of us, if we're honest with you, that doesn't reflect the way we handle our spiritual lives sometimes? We come to church, and I hear people all the time, oh, man, I was just so convicted over this, or, you know, God always just moves and He speaks to me, and I just feel, I just feel so challenged, or I just feel like God's wanting this, or God's wanting that. And we talk about all the feelings we get from worship. Man, I love listening to that song because it just makes me really think. Is that really the the ultimate purpose of the cross is so that we will think? Is it really just, did Christ go to the cross so that I would just feel bad about my sin? Did Christ just go to the cross so that I would just sit in the worship service and get emotionally charged up? I'm going to be honest with you all, like, I've been guilty of this. I, I search for that feeling of getting close to God, but sometimes... I chase the feeling more than actually being close to God. And I, I want to feel something when I come to worship. I want to feel inspired. I want to feel challenged. I want to, I want to be encouraged. I want to be discouraged. Whatever you're looking for. But if we're honest with ourselves, it's kind of like our cholesterol labs. We, 
think about it while we're here, but when we walk out, it just really doesn't translate into anything different in our lives. You see, Rahab had a choice. She, she knew the facts about God. It, it changed how she saw herself and her current circumstances, and then she decided to actually put into practice something that would make her circumstances different. I tell people all the time, I think in churches we've, we've mistaken knowledge with holiness, attendance with, 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 with goodness. I mean, even when we want to get close to God, people tell me all the time, man, I need to get closer to my relationship to the Lord, and then they see me as a pastor, and what's the first thing you think people tell me every time? I've got to get back to church. And while that is true, and there may be some, a piece of that that is true, presence in a building does not equate to holiness. Attendance doesn't equate to holiness. It doesn't, it doesn't translate that way. True faith is when we take what we hear, what we are inspired, what we are challenged to do, and we begin to put it into practice, even if it's raw and rough and not real pretty. I believe God is more honored in that than just being inspired by an eloquent sermon week in and week out. I'm assuming you listen to someone else, but anyway. You, know. you see, there's an action that has to take place. Don't miss that. Rahab did not make it into Hebrews chapter 11 into the, quote, hall of faith because she knew a lot of neat things about God. She didn't make it into the hall of faith because she realized the current situation she was in. It says she made it because she hid the spies. She did something with it. And so that's my challenge to us today. Myself, you, anyone listening, what is it that God has challenged you to do today? Some of us, we walked into this room knowing that there's something in our life that we've been disregarding. Maybe it's a conversation we need to have. Maybe it's a, a job we need to take. Maybe it's a job we need to leave. Maybe it's a financial decision we need to make. Maybe it's a, a, a relationship that needs to be reconciled. But we all have those things. Amen? We do. We have those things. Most every one of us in this room right now, if I said, is there one thing in your life that you say, I know God has convicted me of this, but I just haven't quite done it yet. Almost all of us have that thing. The question is not, do I have that thing? The question is, what do I do with that thing? And some of us in this room, we need to have some hard conversations. We need to have some uncomfortable conversations. We need to do some things that actually have action and not just knowledge. Do you want God to use you in an extraordinary way? Then commit to making sure you believe the right things about who God is. Make sure that that leads to you having a right belief of who you are yourself. And lastly, decide what you're going to do about what you learn. How many of us, when we go to our prayer time, when we go to our time in the morning, we read the Word, whatever it is, we go to it going, God, what do you want to do with me today? I wonder. I wonder how much different our prayer lives would be. You know, we always talk about, man, it's so hard to pray. It's so hard to get in the Word consistently. I wonder how hard it would be if every day was an opportunity to see God show up in an extraordinary fashion. God, what is it you want to teach me so that I can do it today? I think it's still because we know it's just superficial. When's the last time you went to God's Word like that? God, show me something I can do in your kingdom. Open my eyes to the people around me. God, open my eyes to the world around me. Help me see people like you see them. Help me, God, be obedient to what I already know to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you for each and every person in this room. God, I thank you for the opportunity just to share your word. And Father, as we do uh, consider what we've heard today, God, let us be inspired. Let us be uh, God, challenged. Let us, let, it, let us be convicted. But God, let it not stop there. God, let us put into practice the words that we have heard from you. God, let us put into practice, uh, God, the hard things that you're convicting us of. 
God, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, God, let them, let them come together or come now, God, and just to profess you as their Savior and, and to ask for forgiveness of their sins and to ask to be saved. God, that's my prayer is that we would not just hear, but God, we would be doers of that word. And Father, for those who are already maybe believers, God, I pray that we would uh, not be content with just hearing, not be content with just knowing, not be content with just being convicted and feeling, but God, let us be content with doing, with acting on what you have shown us. And Lord, help us to just see that, God, any situation that looks ordinary can be turned into something extraordinary when we're obedient to you. And Father, I do pray that you would be with us as we go our separate ways, that God, you would be honored and magnified and glorified in all that we do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.